what's not to watch. They're the best at what they do, and I'm the best at what I do, and together it's like, it's on. In case some of you wonder who the best is, they're up here on this plaque on the wall. You sure you're ready for this? I'll do my best. Your best? Losers always whine about their best. Winners go home and f*** the prom queen. Here we go, boys and girls. We are live on the best soccer show, North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV. We are ahead of USA Scotland, live from Everbank Stadium Field something in Jacksonville, Florida. The name of that stadium weirds me out, Jared. Jared Dubois with me, as usual. Everbank is like the forever bank? I don't get it. Yeah, I don't really understand. Like, your bank goes on forever? Is that... That's, I guess that's a good thing. It instills confidence. Uh, like I said, pregame USA Scotland, we are going to do a show up until kickoff. Uh, we are g- giving you bonus show. We thought we were going to do half an hour. We're going to end up doing more than that. Uh, joined live off the top of the show by uh, expert analyst Alexi Lawless, former U.S. international. How are you, Alexi? Greetings, guys. It is an absolute pleasure to be here, not only in voice, but uh, Visually here for you. This is like competing man caves, competing <laughs> grottoes. So I have brought my A game. We with, cannot uh, compete guitars with guitars and all sorts of stuff behind me. Yeah, and, there's and no competition. Doubt, and a rat shirt. So and, I'm ready to go. And a rat shirt. Absolutely. All right, Alexi. We've uh, we've got lineups. We've got uh, we've got this five game tournament situation that Jurgen Klinsmann uh, is keeps talking about. First of all, let, before we get to the lineup, and that's what everybody's going to want to talk about. But I. I about this five game tournament thing, how do you process this? Is this does it make sense to you the way he's trying to handle this camp? It, it makes sense the way he explains it, but I think that there's a practical uh, reality that we have to come to terms with where while while he might want to approach this as a tournament and this is the first game of that tournament, he doesn't have all the players that are going to be playing. And in a tournament, it's one thing to talk about uh, platooning players, but you really don't do that. You play your best, you go out there with all guns blazing, and you expect yes. something to happen. So when, you, when, you, when I look at, at this game in particular, without the likes of Josie Altidore and Clint Dempsey, it's not really a tournament. Having, but if he is approaching it like that, and I said this uh, earlier in my podcast, the U.S. should beat Scotland. Right. The team is a better is a better team right now in 2012. Scotland is a team that I don't think has qualified for a World Cup or a European Championship since the 90s. Uh, this is a situation where it's the first game, and if the U.S. was ever lucky enough to come into a tournament and pull the likes of Scotland in their first game, boom, <laughs> you better be coming with all guns yeah. blazing and get that three points and take it to the bank. Yes. Yeah, when uh, it comes I, to a European team, Scotland's not, not exactly the worst you could do. Uh, but also, we were talking about the lineup. The lineups, lineups are out, and ever since about midweek, people's got – your conclusion threw out a certain phrase that people have been talking about forever, the Christmas tree. And we call it the Tannenbaum here because we want to have it a German flair. No, you now call it the Tannenbaum. Ah, okay, okay, well, you went with me on it, all right? Yeah, so, God. But in this lineup, you got uh, Marisa Du, uh, Michael Bradley, and Jermaine Jones – Three defensive midfielders. Is this going to be a Christmas tree-like formation that we're going to see here, uh, Lexi? Uh, I don't necessarily. I think there will be some ornaments that kind of go in different <laughs> directions on that tree. Um, w- when you do have the three guys like uh, Marisa Du, Bradley, and Jones, yes, they're all defensive type of midfielders. But I think that Michael Bradley has been much more involved in the offense and will continue to push up. I'm real interested to see, in particular, how Torres fits into this tree, wherever it is on that uh, on that tree. Obviously, it's going to be much in a much more advanced and creative type of position because every time I talk to Jurgen Klinsmann, he mentions how great this player is, and in a sense that he wants to build it around Torres, and he hasn't had that opportunity to do so. So, how he functions within this tree and how everything goes through him or doesn't go through him, I think, is really really important uh, going forward. But once again, if this is it, uh, it's no more about uh, going out there and, and, and tinkering. Well, all right, Torres is back in the lineup now. Is this a whole different type of U.S. team in the, in the style that they play? Is that what we're going to see here? It's going to be fascinating for me to see Torres and then obviously up top with, uh, with young Boyd up there. Right. You mentioned that uh, this obviously isn't the strongest lineup he has because he doesn't have Altidore. He doesn't have Dempsey. He doesn't have uh, Gooch. I don't know if that's if Gooch is a definite starter right now, but you think that, that healthy and playing well, he's in this lineup as well. Um, is, but you, 
it, since it's not going to be the strongest lineup, is this uh, is this still tinkering? He keeps talking about not this is not experimentation anymore. We know we, we've been working for the past five months, whatever it is, or on nine months on this team. We know what we've got. This is what we're going with. Is this still experimentation? Is Torres in that spot experimentation? Well, uh, if you talk about the players that aren't aren't there, all right. So Dempsey comes in. Where does he go? Well, we've been talking about the fact that he's going to play withdrawn uh, behind the forward. So he goes, in my estimation, where Torres. Now Dempsey and Torres are very, very different players very uh, different. individually. They all have their. They both have their qualities. But when Torres plays, it's a very different style than what Dempsey does. Boyd obviously Altador uh, goes in uh, up top right there, uh, and then Oguchionye will possibly comes in for camera. But I think there's a whole lot more competition than than we are led to believe. Sure with regards sure. to that center back position sure. right now. So I, I think the problem with a, a situation like this with the Torres is, well, we recognize what the starting lineup is going to be when everybody's healthy. Torres mm -hmm. comes in and the team, because of the way he plays, conceivably could play a completely different way. That could be good and that could be bad. We're going to see how that all shapes out here tonight. Right. Well, we're not, are we talking about, sorry, Jared, are we talking about Torres as, as just a stand-in for Dempsey? And does, does that, like you said, does that change the way that they play does who's, a, to, who's to say Donovan's not a stand-in for Dempsey? Okay, or yeah, it, 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 or one of the you know we talk about the defensive midfielders, but Bradley's going to, to play more advanced. One of those guys is, is one of those guys going to come off if Dempsey's in this team. That's I've still there's still so many questions here. Well, what you could do is if you're looking at a situation where you feel you're going to have a lot of the ball and you're going to have opportunities to go forward, you can sacrifice one of those, what we've talked about earlier, one of those defensive type minded uh, midfielders, either uh, not, not a Bradley, because I don't think he's going anywhere, but maybe a Jermaine Jones or something like that, or a Marisa right. do and add that and, and add Dempsey and have a much more creative and attacking type of game. And Jurgen's been, been pretty open about saying, I'm not married to one type of system. And so I yeah. think you are going to see a changing, not just just with game to game, but he's also done it even within games where he switched to a, back right. to a four four two, and it's had a right. dramatic effect on the way that this team plays. Sure. No, Cameron gets to start here at the center back position. And I personally was kind of surprised midweek when Klinsman came out and he was talking about the depth at the center back position and the competition, and the players that weren't there, saying that Tim Ream is technically behind Cameron in, in far as his estimation. Were you surprised by that? Do you think that Tim Ream is behind Cameron for the center back uh, roster pool? I think he really likes Cameron, and I think he likes him because he has the distribution qualities that Tim Ream has, but he also has uh, um, an ability physically to handle when it gets down and dirty. Now, right. the, the knock on Cameron, and we've talked about this at, at times, is that he still has this midfield mentality. I think he's been very, very uh, good at talking about how much he wants to play uh, defense, and that is where his focus is. Well, I want to see it tonight. I want to see him defend. I don't care if he doesn't go forward once. I want to see him win the ball and right. play it out of pressure, not just win the ball to clear it into the stands, win the ball to maintain possession and then play the right ball into the feet. If he does that all game, I'm golden. I'm happy with him, and I think he is ahead of Tim Reed. Right, but it, it, and and if that's the case, if he can do that, then he's he's certainly in the mix to be ahead of Aguchi Onyewu as well. Because Without a doubt, he's he can better. Play, he's better with the ball. Better with the ball than Aguchi Onyewu. Um, so you've got uh, you've got those things to look at: the Cameron situation, the Torres situation, how Michael Bradley works it, uh, what uh, what uh, Boyd does up top. It, it, this this seems like a lot pretty early for t for Boyd. Is are, are, do we think he's he's prepared? I mean, that's Scotland, okay, but do we think yeah. he's prepared to handle this? And and yes, okay, Altador comes in, he's probably on the bench. He's the closest physical archetype to Altador, sure. though. Sure, I, I understand that, and he's the age wise, they're they're right in the same age group. It's just that he Terrence Boyd has no has no first team experience as a professional. He's been playing in the fourth division in Germany. It, it, does is that any alarm bells for you, Alexi? No, because I think it's uh, I think it's I think it's realistic. We talk about how this player deserves it or this player earns it, and you know I know we we had, we went back and forth on Twitter about that. This yes. is a perfect example. There's no way you can possibly make a case that Terrence Boyd deserves not only to be with the national team but starting with the national okay, team. But I have, I have I have people who come at me and say he does, but that's just because of potential no, deserves no, it absolutely on absolutely not. But what he what he deserves it because the only person that matters. 
Jurgen Klinsmann believes that he has the tools to fit into the system and to play that position, uh, like you were saying, behind Altidore and be that second person. And so that's why he is the perfect. I have no problem with him calling him in. I have no problem with him starting here right now. But, you know, to talk about, well, there's other players that have done more. Yeah, there's plenty of other players that have done more. But when Jurgen Klinsmann looks at this guy, he sees something that, you know what, he is going to fit into my system. There's and there's you know different players. You're obviously you, there's no problems with Terrence Boyd being ahead of Chris Wondolowski or, or Hercules Gomez in this situation. Uh, Hurts coming in on just like a day's. I mean, you're not expecting Hurts to just jump right into this team well, right he's now. Not, he's barely, barely. He's not going to take that spot. Yeah. This yeah. is the way Kinsman wants to play. He's not taking Boyd's spot. So and, and he's not going to play with two strikers at least to start out. And like Alexi said, they they he could adjust as the game goes on. Um, but we'll have to see what how, how that plays out and whether or not because because that's the thing you talk about deserved and not deserved or whatever. Alexi, the fan base believes that certainly Hercules Gomez, maybe not as much Chris Wondolowski because he's had chances and he hasn't taken advantage of them. But her, certainly people believe that Hercules, Go, Hercules Gomez deserves a shot in this team. Uh, doesn't because it doesn't might, it might not be what what Klinsman but It's wants. about goals, but that's about goals. Okay, I mean Chad Marshall deserves a shot. But he doesn't score goals. So when you can really qualify it and, and, and quantify it by, by the number of goals it scores, it, it just jumps at, out at you. And I completely understand that. And especially when you're talking about the U.S. team, which doesn't have a lot of people that can score goals. You want guys that have proven that they can score goals. And Jurgen Klinsmann has talked about, hey, I'm measuring this on the amount of goals they can score. So Jurgen constantly goes back and forth between saying something and, and, and what he does. And, you know, th- that's OK. He's trying to keep all his options uh, open. But it's not about the best players. It's about the best group that Jurgen Klinsmann thinks. Alexi, yesterday, four players get cut to make the 23-man roster. Um, two of the ones I want to talk about, he chooses Boyd over Agudelo and uh, Joe Corona over Graham Zuzzi. Now, how much of this do you feel is these are the right players for the system and for the team versus we kind of have to talk about it now because of the Tiffy Chandler issue that happened last week, whereas are they keeping these guys around to make sure they get capped? Oh boy, you are. Listen, ah, uh, boy. I'm a the, conspiracy uh, theorist. I'm a conspiracy theorist. I know exactly. Theorist. It's a practical um, issue. I, I I do think that they got burned on Chandler, and I think they went back and said, you know what? Oh, it was worth taking the risk, but we cannot let this happen again, especially as they get closer and closer to the World Cup. So I think there is an element of hey. If we're going to have players out there, and you know, you saw uh, the comments come out from uh, uh, Terrence Boyd earlier, and it was amazing. I don't know if he 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 they were his or if somebody wrote him, but it was like, God bless America, and, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I love this country. And in and in the he, context of what had happened over the last month, uh, it was just interesting to see him talk about that. I don't doubt for a second that that he is a very different mindset uh, than Timothy Chandler is right, right now, and and I love that. I love that about him. Uh, but you're you're absolutely right. There is an element of you know get these guys tied to the U.S. so they can't backtrack. Well, but I got a question on that. And you and I, we've had you on the show, and we've talked about you know you want guys that want to play for your for the national team it doesn't see that's that's why i'm not so worried about timmy chandler or at least i'm not i'm not bothered but in some i'm some serious level and i'm not going to rage at, at timmy Timmy chandler yeah he probably shouldn't have played for the u.s if he wasn't positive but he wasn't positive and now he's he's not and and fine we move on i want guys that want to play for this team uh, it looks like terrence boyd wants to play for this team it looks like joe corona wants to play for this team but at some point you want to you're going to lock them in and then if they decide oh well you know i'm not really feeling it anymore then they're just going to continue to show up out of obligation. I, I mean, just as no, a, no, no. Then, but then you just get rid of them, and you're not you're not worried about them going someplace else and doing damage. You know, that, that's that, what every coach fears. All right, regardless if it's club <laughs> or international, that you let somebody go, that you trade. By the way, every GM too. But I know I, that, yeah, the no, worst no. fear <laughs> is that some you let somebody go and he goes someplace else and he does well, and you have to Alan come to Gordon. Grip with it. Yeah, yeah, you have to come to grips with it, and you have to just say, you know what, he didn't do well because of the situation here. It doesn't mean that he can't do well somewhere over there, but when you can hedge your bets and do things that are going yeah. to have you save face later on down the line, maybe you got to do that. Yeah, and, and Jared brought up, you know, maybe uh, maybe Timmy Chandler plays for Germany and beats the U.S. and blah, 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 and I'd be bothered by that, but I'd be bothered by it because it's a loss, not because it's Timmy Chandler that oh, don't, does Don't things. take it. Get off the high horse. You I'm would serious. be bothered by it. I, no, it would not make my pain any significantly greater, depending <laughs> on don't care enough. No, it's it's not about that guy. It's about losing the game, and that's what I care about as a fan. But okay, and maybe Joe Corona, you might worry about that if he ends up playing for Mexico. And I think he's eligible for where else? Uh, uh, Central America, somewhere. Uh, you worry about him, you know, those teams beating you and qualifying or in a Gold Cup situation. 
But really, if Terrence Boy, not Terrence Boy, but if, if Timmy Chandler plays for Germany eventually, how many times are we going to face Germany? If we face Germany, unless it's a friendly and then so what? If we face Germany, it's going to be on a big stage. And then, you know, that's... Uh, I'm not going to be bothered by... He be be if he ends up being the Torsten Frings, put handball in the ball off the line in a World that's Cup, different. you're not going to be different. mad at Timothy Chandler? That's different. Cheating is different than beating <laughs> us. That's completely different. Uh, Alexi, i got to move on to, uh, to Landon Donovan, okay? He, mm -hmm. he has this powwow with these uh, uh, soccer reporters, and he kind of intimates that you know, the fire's not there anymore or not as, as, as burning as brightly. Uh, what do you make of, of that? He's been in this mix. He's been the guy for 10 years. Is it yeah. a natural situation? Is there anything he can do as a player? Oh, yeah. I, I think he can do a lot. I think he can still help Jurgen Klinsmann. I think he can still help the U.S., and I think he will ultimately still help the U.S. in their next two years. Uh, the interview that he gave, you know, I read it, and, and, and I shook my head because while I can – sympathize and empathize with what he's trying to say and I love the fact that at times Landon is very very honest almost to a fault and it, it was almost a, a form of therapy this this round table that he sat down with like, like, talking about where right. he sees himself and <laughs> right. uh, but not necessarily the best message to send out there for a guy who over the years has taken plenty of shots for being for being soft and right. not necessarily being as motivated as other players and 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 then you and then he does the compare and contrast with Clint Dempsey and uh, you know just kind of digging himself uh, deeper. Having said that. If anybody deserves the, the right to, to go out on his own terms, it's Landon Donovan. I don't think anybody's going to argue that he has done more for this, uh, for this sport and for this national team on and off the field than a lot of other players. And will go down, in my estimation, is a, a one, if not the greatest American soccer player. And I, and I do believe that regardless of what he said in that interview, he's going to be important. And I think it would be a mistake for Jurgen Klinsmann, although I guarantee that Jurgen shook his head when he read, that, uh, read, read those comments. Uh, I guarantee that, that uh, Jurgen is going to find a way to use him because he still has a lot of value and worth going forward. Now, Dempsey doesn't get to play tonight. A um, little bit of, I think they said hamstring in, uh, issue or something like that. Questionable for Brazil. How much of a problem is it for the U.S. if going into the first game of World Cup qualifiers, even though it's not against a big fish or anything like that, that Landon Donovan and Clint Dempsey still may yeah. not be on the field at the same time going into the first game of World Cup qualifying? It's not ideal. Uh, obviously, uh, <laughs> Jurgen Klinsmann would love to have had that situation. But if you go back to this five-game stretch, and if, if, we, if we look at it as a tournament, and I have because that's what Jurgen Klinsmann has talked about. So well, that's why I'm saying tonight, you get your three points and you get out of dodge. I don't care. You, you make sure that it's a clinical and efficient and a ruthless performance tonight, and you get three points. Two nothing. Thank you very much, USA. Sitting pretty at the top of the group right now with three points. Now comes the second game. And the second game is often against a very, very good opponent in a, in a tournament situation. Let's take a World Cup. So now you got to play against Brazil. So when they go out against Brazil next week, I want to see them come out with an understanding and a perspective and a reality that they're facing a very, very good team and find a way to get a result. Yeah. And that, it, that is the tournament type of thing. So with or without Clint Dempsey on the field... I don't think that next uh, the next game matters a tremendous amount. If he's there, it would be great because we want to see those two on the field together and see what they can do. But let's be honest. Do we want to see them or, or, or the chances that they're going to do something special against a team like Brazil or somebody else? So uh, I'm being practical about this five-game uh, tournament and about these three games and certainly what comes up next against a team like Brazil. Now, first games of tournaments usually tend to be very defensive-minded and about limiting losses or limiting risk. Do you think that might be one of the reasons why we've seen three defensive midfielders in the lineup for U.S. national team tonight? Maybe, although uh, if my recollection is, cor is correct, the only time the U.S. since 1990 has won an opening game has been in 2002 against Portugal, and Portugal. that that didn't turn out so bad for us. So <laughs> I, I think you can set yourself up, but I, I think there is just a, a natural tendency in, in human nature to go out there and say, all right, this is the first game. Let's just not blow it on the first game, mm -hmm, that, right. like we saw in, in 2006, where right. basically after that first game, it was like, it, it's over. We might as well yeah. pack up our bags and go home. When things are that uh, compressed and that's the situation you're dealing with, you're right. No, a risk is try you're trying to limit risk. All right, uh, we're going to get you out of here. Do you have a, a prediction? Can I put you on the spot for a prediction tonight? USA, Scotland, two nothing. Florida? 2 nothing. 2 nothing, U.S. And, and I think that 
if if U.S. fans don't expect that from this team in 2012 against a team like uh, like uh, like Scotland, then they're being uh, naive, and I don't think that they're really assessing the situation. This is this is a good team, and and Jurgen Klinsmann, I'm using his words. It's the the time for experimentation is over, and it it means something right now. Well, if that's the case, then you go out there and you get a result, but. You do it in a different way because we have to go back to what Jurgen Klinsmann has promised from the beginning in a more proactive way, playing out of the back, not losing composure when you're coming out of the back, having a much higher line of defense, putting teams under pressure from the start. All the things that he's talked about have to start to come to fruition and ultimately result in positive results. All right. That's Alexi Lalas. You can see him on ESPN. You can hear him on The Shot, which is a daily podcast he does. Uh, You can hear him on, is it Big Head, Red Head? I want to make sure I get that right. Uh, yeah, Alex- me and Taylor Twelman have a podcast. You can check that on ESPN. By the way, and all that. Great that you added Mark Connolly. I've been a fan of Mark Connolly for years. Great addition to the show over there. He, he is the man. And just let me say before I go, I wish you guys all the luck in the world. I listen to you every week. We've been uh, colleagues and friends for a long time, and I appreciate it. Uh, everything that you guys do for soccer uh, going forward. I appreciate it, Alexi. All right, th- I just got called Alexi Lalas's colleague. My life is uh, <laughs> best soccer show, North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with your phone calls. Jason Davis, Jared Dubois, back on the Best Soccer Show live ahead of USA Scotland. Coming up in about, I don't know, 29 minutes or so. Yeah, we like- thought the kickoff was going to be a lot earlier than it, than it is. but uh, yeah. So we're going we're gonna to try to fill this time, but we want to fill it with you. Yes, we are live. So that means phone calls. 201-430-2378 is the phone number. And if you have Skype, just get us at Best Soccer Show. Somebody tried to get in, get, get in while we were talking to Alexi. Uh, sorry, <laughs> you're not sorry gonna... I, I got a bigger name on the line. Yeah, we're, we're, we're not going to bump or, or put Alexi on hold to take a phone call. But I'm sure everybody's got, got thoughts on this lineup, Jared. And 
you mentioned whether it's a Christmas tree or a Tannenbaum or whatever. Tannenbaum. A Tannenbaum or, or Das Christmas tree, I saw somebody say. All right, here, here's our first phone call, area code uh, 216. Who's this? I'm sorry, what? Who's this? Uh, Jason. Hey, sorry. Jason. Are you listening to the show while you're talking to us? Yeah, I just turned up. All right. Awesome. So what's right on your mind tonight? Uh, I just want to talk. I heard about um, I heard about that AZ Alkmaar kept uh, Josie from coming in until you know May twenty eighth, even though their season ended May six. I just wanted to see what they thought about why haters. <laughs> well, I mean, look, the AZ Alkmaar is under no obligation per FIFA guidelines to release Josie Altidore until the twenty eighth, and they decided that they were just going to be jerks and what for whatever reason. Maybe they thought, okay. There's, they've got a five game stretch coming up. If we hold him out of one game, that limits, you know, that reduces the risk of him getting injured by just that much. Because look, Ajax is a big, I mean, sorry, Ajax. AZ Agmar is a, uh, a good sized club playing in a big league. They're the type of club that sees them, you know, their interest as preeminent. They want their players healthy. But what else is he doing? No, I understand that. But think about this is the club country conflict, and it's going to continue. It's going to get worse. Clubs, and as Americans get better and bigger, they go to bigger clubs, it's going to be exactly. more of an issue as well. Clubs want to be compensated when guys get hurt on national team duty. There is a constant back and forth um, a, a, about those situations when players can be released. I think FIFA is, is going to take away a date next year or something like that. I mean, I, I, I'm not positive on the details on that, but I know that there's been discussions that, that – uh, that there's a club association which MLS is involved in, by the way. That you know, it, it used to be the the G14 or whatever they were called, um, the biggest clubs in Europe in a, in a little yeah. group. There's a bigger umbrella organization now, and that group is lobbying for the rights of clubs versus uh, international soccer. When when these situations come up, when guys get hurt with their national team, and it, it because the clubs pl- pay them, they're on their contracts are paid by the clubs, not the national team. They might get paid by but the national team. To me, team. this is just th- this is just them being assy. I don't know another way of saying it. You know, like what do they have to gain? What do they have to gain by not la- letting him out earlier? I mean, if anything, he's going to have his body. He's going to have time to introduce his body back into into uh, playing again after having a week or two off. Now he's going to have to jump right into the international level with less days to train and get ready for. It. I think that's more of a risk to his body. <laughs> I I and I tend to agree with you, but I'm sure they've got you know all of these clubs have they're they're running numbers now. I'm sure they've done some kind of statistical analysis to they check. They all got my coach. Out. Yeah, they have me coach, my coach, whatever that is. Is it my coach? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Are you still there, Jason? Yeah, yeah. You know, I was uh, I was thinking along the same lines as Jared. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to have someone just jump in right in the international you know level of play with only two days with the team. You know, not have well. Okay. Anybody. Yeah, I'm not paid to make those decisions. Right. Well, so. let's let's talk conspiracy theory. Jared brought one up. Ooh, we I love it. Lexi, let me put my tinfoil hat on. What if after a long season, after putting forth all that effort, what if Josie told Alkmar, Az Alkmar, you know, I need a little bit of a break. Can you guys push the issue? You don't have to release me to the 28th. Can you tell Klinsman that you say he's you- pulling he's pulling a Chandler? Um, uh, well, it's a little different than that. Eventually, <laughs> well, you always talk about Nuremberg, like looking out for his interest. They weren't wasn't releasing him. He hid behind right. his club team a yes. number of times. I'm I'm not putting that. I'm not saying that. That's I'm just the possibility has to be out there, right? That that maybe it, Joe. It, listen, the guy ran into a signboard like a couple weeks ago. I mean, yep. maybe hey. maybe his body's hurting a bit. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Why wouldn't you? I mean, okay, your obligation to your national team versus taking a little bit of a break. You know, six and one, half dozen in the other, and uh, you know, just say, "Hey, look, guys, tell them I'm not, I'm not coming to the 28th, and that it's your decision." Because because Az Alkmaar doesn't lose in that situation. It's not like they have a, you know, it's not like they're losing face with clear. Honestly, put- I, I'm kind of approaching this as uh, Altidore's loss is maybe our and the U.S. national team's gain because we're going to get to see what Terrence Boy can do for 90 minutes, or maybe yeah, not 90, sure. but at least 60, 70 minutes with the A number one stars minus Clint Dempsey, basically, of this offense. And yeah, we're well, going to see what's this, is this man child able to really fill Josie's shoes? Wait, wait, okay. So let me ask you this. He's a man child. I know the same age. I know. Is, is Josie a man child as well? I guess he Josie, is. I, I've upgraded Josie from man child to grown ass man. Grown ass man. He's been upgraded. I, just, I think his, that's his right. back to goal game has gotten good enough that he can upgrade. And he's and he's scoring. So I mean, you can't take that away from him. I got anything else, Jason? Uh, no, that's it. Thanks a lot for everything you do. Love right. the show, man. Thanks, man.
Uh, enjoy the game. We do have a question from the chat room, and this was put in there, and they're asking for our thoughts of Torres at left wing. And I'm not sure that's what this is. It's not really what this is. I, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, you're you're playing with uh, that line of of mids, and and okay, Bradley pushes up on the on the right side. I, is that where Bradley is? Bradley's on the right I side. I think Bradley's going to be in the center, and it's going to be Jam- Jermaine Jones on one side and um, Risa Du on the other. Uh, but I don't think you're going to see any true left winger on this in this lineup. And they're going to be trading positions all day. I, I imagine not, that the left wing here is going to be occupied by Fabian Johnson. For the most part. For the most part. In, in, in the attack, absolutely. I, I think that uh, with this formation, with the guys that you have on the field, uh, Atlanta Donovan's probably going to have some freedom to roam. I mean, you got... Tarundolo out there on the right as well, so he doesn't have to. Donovan doesn't have to hug the touchline if he doesn't want to. He can drift inside. I I think that you're going to see a bunch of people moving around, and, that, and then that makes that makes Torres not a left, not in in that classic way that you think of a left winger. He's not. No, I, I, he'll be inside most of the day. I, they'll be playing right below Terrence Boyd, trying to play off of him. I'm just looking into this game. I'm looking to see how Jose uh, Torres, does he play inside? Does he play outside? And if, you, if, he, if he does play inside, which I think he will, how's he going to combine with Terrence Boyd? And how's he going dis- to help as the distributor from Michael Bradley to Boyd? Those are what, that's basically his role. He's going to be distributing. Yeah, well, and, and that's He's the not going to give you the offensive attacking component that Clint Dempsey's going to give you in that same position. Well, we talked about what he does and what he does well, he doesn't really do his thing that far up the pitch. I mean, he's not a he's not a box to box midfielder. He's not a defensive midfielder, but he's somewhere in between, right? I mean, he's going to sit near the center circle and, and he's going to orchestrate things from there when he gets the ball. He's going to try to move it quickly. He's not going to give you a lot of you know. He's not going to be out there giving you crosses. He's going to be playing the ball on the ground. Yeah, I mean, how you're gonna get? He's just basically he's a cog. To be honest with you, he's a cog. I mean, things are gonna go through him. He's not gonna be the final piece. He's not gonna be the starting piece of any movement. But he's gonna be the player that, if done right, most of the movements will go through. And I think that's basically what Jurgen Klinsmann's trying to do. He's gonna keep the ball on the ground. You're not gonna see Torres playing this ball in the air. He's gonna keep it on the ground. You talked about. We talked about uh, Jeff Cameron and his inclination to to go farther afield than than maybe he should as a defender. Is Jose Francisco Torres going to be able to do it in the other direction? Where he's is he going to be able to push himself forward when maybe his instinct is to sit deeper? Because that, that if you want him to be part of that part of the attack in a a direct part of the attack rather than just linking things up from defense to to the forward line, then he needs to be upfield farther. He if you're needs- seeing if you're seeing Michael Bradley and Jose Francisco Torres close enough that they could high five each other. Francisco uh, Torres is having problems with his with his positioning. They should not be that close together. And I think that you're right. I think you may see him retreat to a place that he's more comfortable with. And this is assuming that we're we're right on where his positioning is going to be, if, if, judging sure. by the lineup. But I, if he can, if he, I think you're going to find him way too withdrawn in this game. He's going to try to find the ball rather than let the ball find him, and I, that could be a problem. All right, we've talked about the the U.S. national team ad nauseum here. We've got Alexi Lalas in. We've got our thoughts on this lineup and, and these guys that are in and, and who's missing and all of that. We haven't talked about Scotland at all and what to expect from them, Jared. Do you? That's not what it's about for me, I guess. Okay, but but it, but it matters because the the opponent dictate can dictate how you play. Now in this situation, like Alexi said, we want the U.S. to go out and dictate everything that they can possibly do. They, we want them to take the game to to Scotland because that's what Klins- Klinsman has said he wants his team to do. And I'm no expert, and I, I can't tell you when I've ever seen the the Scottish national team play. But I've done as much reading as I can ahead of this game, and from what I understand, they're going to play defensive. That's that's just the way the Scott the, the Scots play. There, uh, I think I've seen a four-one-four-one. They've got a couple of nice pieces. They're expecting the debut of an English-born uh, Scottish player, um, Phillips, who plays at, at Blackpool, who's supposed to be fairly exciting, a, a, a speedy winger type. They've got Barry Bannon from Aston Villa. They've got some some other pieces in there. I think he's a, from Aston Villa. Last time I checked. So there's it's it's not a it's not it's how did Kenny you Miller that? Kenny Miller's in this team. Kenny, Kenny Miller can score goals. I mean, that, that that's not an issue. Yeah. So, so you have to at least be on your toes, in in the sense that, in the sense that the United States needs to be taking things to opponents to get ready for those qualifiers when they are going to be the better team for at least you know until next year. Every time out, this is this is a decent challenge, right? I mean, the, the, Scotland's probably going to be better than anybody you're going to face 
out of this group except for Brazil, right? Brazil, uh, yeah. We compare Scotland to Canada, but you should be taking the game to Scotland. And then yeah, you- I think Guatemala is probably uh, right behind Scotland in the in the group of people over the five game tournament style that we're going to be seeing. I think you look Brazil, Scotland, Guatemala, Canada, Barbuda, and Antigua. You know, I think that's kind of the the hierarchy of, of those t- of those five nations. Um, I'm I'm kind of stoked that in a game against Scotland, you have two players pl- uh, playing four Rangers in this lineup. Two guys are going to be very familiar with a lot of the names that are in this lineup. Uh, I, maybe that's why Marisa Du gets the uh, gets the nod, and that's why there's a third defensive midfielder in this team, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, more than anything, I think that Klinsman, in talking about first games of a of a tournament cycle, is going to go kind of defensive here. Make sure that he gets a result, you know, and not put not expose himself too much. And I think that's the reason why you see those players there. Who's manning the Twitter machine right now for the best soccer show? Because uh, yeah, that's the wrong phone number that we just tweeted out. <laughs> well, why don't you put it out again then? Two zero one four three zero two three seven eight is the phone number again. Skype best soccer show. We've got one phone call. I, I thought we'd have a little bit more reaction from people and what they expected. Maybe everybody is just kind of numbed by the lineup because it does look incredibly defensive. I just gave lip service to taking the game to Scotland, but it makes it difficult when you have, I mean, out of these, uh, out of the guys in this game, who are you really counting on to, to hold possession? Who, do, who is, who is Landon most? Landon Donovan. Okay. Landon. Who's the, go ahead. Landon, Landon Donovan is the one going to hold position. I think Michael Bradley as well. Michael Bradley is going to be try your ball winner and uh, and where a lot of the points of the attack are going to start from. In, in, that, in, that, in that case, I'm looking at this lineup. This is how I would like most things to go when we're, if we're playing out of the back. I would like uh, Tim Howard to give the ball to Jeff Cameron to give the ball to Michael Bradley who gives the ball to Landon Donovan who gets it to uh, Terrence Boyd. That's how I want it to go. Yeah, Every- if that doesn't happen, it starts becoming kind of a train wreck, isn't it? I'm, I'm kind of worried when you start getting Marisa Du's uh, creative uh, midfielder skills at, 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 at uh, you kind of <laughs> that's not the guy I want on the ball I guess I think his I think of his skill set is something else I know he scored goals for Rangers this season and uh, but it's just not that I don't know I just don't see offense when I see this lineup didn't score goals like you know he, he's not he's not a goal scorer and he's not an attacking midfielder and he's not a creative midfielder and he's not anything but what he is which you know is a fine uh player at his position in certain situations, I'm still. I get. I. I have a. a we have a, a listener. I can't remember his Twitter handle. Who comes at me every single time we mention a Marisa Du because I'm not a fan of Marisa Du in the U.S. Men's National Team lineup right now. I'm just. I just don't think he has a place there. I think there are better options. It's that I, position's so deep. That's why. And I. And I, if you're ranking those positions, I think he's probably third. And but the only problem is in this formation that Clemson's putting out tonight, you have to play your third best defensive midfielder and I, that's where that's the the harsh reality of where we're at with this right and, and why not why not get uh i, I don't have the reserves who are, who's on the bench give me the give me the the fully uh, dressed Beck, squad uh, there okay. uh joe you corona have- joe corona's a little oh, bit too much of a liability though if you throw him at him and torres both in there together yeah. isn't that a little too much like for like i don't know that it hurts th- that i mean they might they might uh, corona's gonna play play more advanced than, than Torres. So you, if you were going to play Corona, you're going to get a different kind of performance, I would expect. Again, don't know what kind of discipline Jose Francisco Torres is going to have in his positioning. If he's going to, to be upfield or if he's going to end up drifting back and, and playing deeper and then that causes problems if you ask well, me. Well, with these subs, it, the only problem is with the subs here, it's all defenders and strikers. There's only two midfielders on the bench, and that's Beckerman and Corona. Beckerman's going to be give you more of what you already have three of in the lineup. So, and Corona so, is one of the youngest, probably the youngest guy. I don't know, maybe the, not the youngest guy, but really boy, definitely the most green guy on your lineup. Boyd and, and Corona both very green in terms of experience. You're going to put both of those guys on the field together. Um, and then, then you go back to what is Clint's been tinkering still. And now you, you brought up that word, and it definitely looks like he's tinkering if you're putting Joe Corona and Boyd in the same game right now. Sure, sure. But and, and maybe I'm, I'm looking at it now. Maybe this is just a case of, of the guys that are not available, the, uh, the Dempsey's mainly, dictate that he does this. Because you're right, except for, I mean, there's, there's not another option except for Joe Corona maybe. And you're not, you know, if, you, if you're pulling one of the three he's got in there, Kyle Beckerman is not really an upgrade in any meaningful way here's the other option you don't play a single striker the other option is if you have all these if you have wandalowski at your disposal hercules gomez at your disposal maybe you go two strikers and you don't have to find all this midfield depth and you can find offense that way but i sure. think you what you're looking at here is klinsman trying to find a way to to work the system he wants to work through these next series of games without having to change 
with the, with the existing components he has. Right. Josie Altidore, Terrence Boyd, very like for like. He doesn't have to change too much of his system. Torres is trying to going to try to play a, a role similar to that of Dempsey. Doesn't have to change too much of his system. I think that's what you're looking at here. He's trying to find out if he can play his system no matter what components he has in there. Who's on the phone, area code 703? Who's this? Hi, this is Chris. How are you? Hey, what's up, Chris? Hey, I just was calling to talk about uh, Tim Howard and uh, who his eventual replacement would be and, and like maybe why Bill Hamid didn't make it this time. Well, I mean, Bill Hamid had uh, the Olympic experience. Um, and then he struggled at his club perform as well. well like, he lost his starting job for a bit. He got hurt, and then he kind of lost his job to, to is it Joe Willis. I'm going to bring him in. Um, yeah. Lost his right. job at D.C., got it back, I think, at this point. I don't know if he's starting yeah, tonight. He Okay, got it yeah. back. I think that Bill Hamid is just, you know, he's he's a very young, he's very young in keeper years, certainly. I, I think it's mainly a, a situation where he doesn't, does Klinsman need a, a, a solidified number two right now, or can he kind of dip uh. it into the water whenever he needs it? Nick Romando is steady. He's not the biggest keeper in the world. He's not, he's not the youngest keeper in the world anymore. If, if you had to replace Tim Howard tomorrow for the game, against, if you have to, put, to re replace Tim Howard for Brazil game, you're going with Nick Romando. He's right, the informed keeper with the most experience, and he's, he's probably the most composed keeper that you have as a veteran right now behind Tim Howard. But the problem is, I think what the question, the question that Chris is asking is, who's the next Tim Howard? Not, not oh, the... Uh, not be no, no, certainly. Tim certainly. Howard retires, you know, so... And it looked like... Uh, you know, Bill Hamid was kind of getting a lot of time and, you know, he didn't even get his first cap for a while, but he was getting in there and kind of learning behind Howard. So it looked like for a while they're kind of grooming him and all of a sudden he's not there. I didn't know if it was because of the, the injury or if DC wanted to keep him. You know, I didn't really, I never heard anything well, about okay. it. Well, is, is, okay, is Bill Hamid going to learn anything sitting on the bench behind Tim Howard? I mean, he's been in camps, he's, he's been in the national team setup. You know what he can do. At okay, did Guzan learn anything playing the bench behind Brad Friedel? Well, I think they do learn something because they get into these camps, right? And then they're training with them, and he's going to pick up things. He's going to see how Howard carries himself, how sure. he plays. Sure, but ultimately... He's successful for so long, you know? But, Chris, I ultimately... Mean, at, at the game on the bench, probably not going to learn anything, but, but training but, and being around them. But, Chris, ultimately what decides whether or not Bill Hamid is the next Tim Howard is how he plays on the club level. Whether or not he's right. getting regular games and playing well, be it, whether it's DC United or if he makes a move in a couple of years and goes abroad, that's going to determine... Uh, whether or not he's the guy to step in for, for Tim Howard. We thought it was Brad Guzan. Brad Guzan didn't get enough time at Aston Villa and on, on lo he played a couple of loan stints. Now he's leaving Aston Villa. If he improves his club situation and Brad Guzan gets a bunch of starts next year, becomes the number one at a championship level team or something like that, then I think he moves back to the top of the list. I I'm going to throw, throw a different Chivas USA goalkeeper name out there. And it, uh, that's it, Dan it, Kennedy. I think he it, needs it, to... Dan Kennedy's been the best MLS keeper probably for the last year or so. Now, does does he need to leave MLS and go abroad and get tested at a higher level before Jurgen Klinsmann's really going to give Dan Kennedy a shot? But he's again, this is to Chris's point. Dan Kennedy is not the next Tim Howard because Dan Kennedy is twenty nine years old and playing in, in in just now becoming good in MLS. I mean, he's very good. Don't get me wrong, but it's not like we've been talking about Dan Kennedy for five years and now he's you know he's turned into this and now he's going to be the the guy. He's Tim Howard is 35, 36 at this point. So you would expect uh is that do I have am I making him too old? Somebody check on yeah, the on 35, yeah. 35-ish. So, you yeah. know, it's 2 years to Brazil. Is Tim Howard going to have have fallen off uh, enough as a keeper to not be your first choice in Brazil? If, it, no. if the answer to that is yes, I mean it's possible. If the answer to that is yes, then then we might have a problem. But again, um, it depends on whether Brad Guzan becomes a starter somewhere. It depends on Bill, if Bill Hamid establishes himself. The competition between Howard and the next guy is so dang deep. Like there's, I mean, there's such a gap between Howard and the next guy. Howard would have to be injured not okay, to wait, be ready. Look, and, and obviously, he's 33, so I aged him by two years. He's gonna be. He's only gonna be 35 ish in in Brazil. I think he's still your number one starter, so you don't have to worry about. Okay, you I mean you you need keepers, but in the interim, but you don't have to worry about having that established hardcore. This is our number one guy. The problem is the U.S. was so was so we're lucky to have we're yeah. Spoiled. Well, we were spoiled for years by having Keller and Friedel vying for a number one spot, and then for a while you had Keller and Howard vying for a number one spot. Now there's no one pushing Tim Howard. I don't think he needs to be pushed, but it makes us maybe a little bit less confident in the situation behind Tim Howard if there isn't anyone there live and pushing him. Yeah, thanks for the call, Chris. Uh, the players are walking out on the field at Everbank Stadium in Jacksonville, Florida, 
wearing the Where's Waldo kits, Jared. I know you can't see it. Uh, see, there. I can't see them. TV's behind me. I'm I'm looking at it. You know, it's. I, I said I wasn't completely against them, and I don't think I'm. I'm like you know, I don't. I don't hate them, but they're not. They're not the best. Is it blue shorts, blue socks? Um, it is blue shorts, white socks. So Ooh, it's, it's I think I would have liked blue and blue a little bit but more it, with it that. Looks very, it looks very South American club ish is what it looks like. You know, it looks not Brazil. It says not bimbo our, on know. it. I'm sorry. They say bimbo on them. <laughs> no, they don't say bimbo. But I mean, it just it just kind of looks like the the shirt that a South American club would wear. And and the numbers on the back or the numbers in the front and the back are in gray or silver, which makes it difficult to see. But at least we've got established numbers, at least for the next five games. We know, and they're wearing their names on the shirts. So and it seems that. like Clemson kind of let players dictate their numbers a little bit. Hercules Gomez gets the number nine instead of Josie. Josie gets 17, which is his normal number. Clint Dempsey some- doesn't get the 10. He gets the eight, which is his normal number. Yeah, it, it, it might have it, it might have been a situation where Herc was first come, first serve with Josie not in camp. All right, you know what? I think we're going to wrap it up here. They're doing anthems. They're getting ready to go. Kick up, kickoff is coming. Join us at halftime. The second the whistle blows, we will be on the air, do a little bit of a halftime show, take your calls, whatever, uh, and then we'll be back um, after the game to do a post game as well. So hit us back, nasn.tv slash live, the best soccer show, North American Soccer Network, nasn.tv. TV. 